with the weather becoming more and more extreme around the world. Resources being continuously depleted. Trash piling up into mountains and debates on environmental issues still ongoing. Our environment is only growing more and more unsafe, so much so that it may even be hazardous to our health. Speaking of infectious diseases, dengue fever must not go unmentioned. It used to be an imported disease, but several local cases in recent years have caused many to worry about whether it will become endemic. In fact, the global incidence of dengue fever has skyrocketed eightfold in the past 20 years. To date, cases have been recorded in 129 countries. Half the world's population is at risk. According to a report by the World Meteorological Organization, the past 10 years were the hottest decade on record. As the planet continues to warm, glaciers are melting rapidly, causing sea levels to rise. More extreme weather events are expected to occur in the future. They'll bring terrible destruction to humanity, wildlife, as well as the ecosystem and environment. No Hong Konger will forget Typhoon Mankut, which struck in September 2018 and left a trail of devastation. Storm surges caused severe flooding in multiple districts and more than 60,000 cases of tree failure, resulting in over 20,000 tons of yard waste, which paralyzed traffic. Due to climate change, Hong Kong's summers are getting hotter and hotter. Tom, a social worker who mainly attends to rural villages, comes into frequent contact with solitary seniors. He says that many elderly don't have air conditioners, while some want to save money or think that turning on the aircon is no use. Having to stay home on a hot day puts them at risk for indoor heat. Over the past 100 years, the Earth's surface temperature has already risen by one degree Celsius. Two thirds of the warming began after 1975. It is mainly attributed to activities such as our extensive use of fossil fuels, deforestation, and intensive livestock farming, all of which generate excessive carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases, causing temperatures to rise. If we don't start thinking about how to reduce carbon emissions, global surface temperatures may rise by another 2.6 to 4.8 degrees Celsius this century. The consequences will be disastrous. Regardless of its function, from the moment an object is made to it being packaged, transported, put on the shelf, taken home, or disposed of in the landfill when it's ultimately unwanted. Carbon emissions are generated at every stage of its life. In 2018, an average of 11,428 tons of municipal solid waste were generated daily in Hong Kong, of which 6,712 tons were household waste, the daily disposal rate was 1.53 kilograms per capita, 5.5% higher than that of 2017. Will the Chung family succeed in completing the challenge? We'll see how they got on after the break. Given Hong Kong's reputation as a shopping paradise, it's no surprise that all sorts of goods are sold on its streets. This is especially true of trendy clothes which come in every style imaginable fueling people's desire to make a purchase. In order to reduce waste, Rona's textile mill utilizes a mechanical system which recycles clothing waste. She hopes to improve the environment by promoting its use within the industry. Alice used to work in fashion design. In 2016, she quit her job and started a second-hand clothing shop. Eventually, she discovered that a lot of her customers wanted someone to help them alter clothes that they liked but no longer fit. So she began offering alteration services to her clients. In recent years, she even started teaching alteration. So long as we're willing to go the extra mile, we can reduce the amount of waste in every single aspect of our lives. For instance, bulky furniture and electrical appliances that are past their prime can also get a new lease on life. In the coming episodes, we'll look at how microplastics are contaminating the ocean and the seafood we eat. Wet wipes are actually made of plastic and not paper. 
Will knowing that make you use less of them? Hong Kongers don't really like using secondhand electronics. When they break down, they'd rather buy new ones than get them fixed, resulting in more and more. Protected by natural barriers and away from effluence of the Pearl River, eastern waters are major coral growing areas in Hong Kong. According to the Agriculture, Fisheries and Conservation Department, coral coverage at survey sites can be up to more than 80 percent. There are 900 coral species in the world. One-tenth of them can be found in Hong Kong, totaling 84 species. Coral is not just a living organism. It is also a food chain ecosystem, providing food and habitats to marine species. Indeed, corals are an important source of protein for human beings. However, we keep polluting the ocean. Sunblock blocks UV rays by forming a physical shield. It is thick and may look white on skin. Sunscreen contains chemical compounds to absorb UV rays. It is relatively thin and sheer. Most products on the shelf are sunscreens. Sunscreens contain artificial chemical compounds. This causes increasing concerns for scientists. They contain chemicals like benzophenone 3 BP3, and ethyl hexylmethoxycinamate, EHMC. Enter the sea, they will affect coral growth and even cause coral bleaching. Palau in the Pacific Ocean, rich in coral reefs, has banned the use of sunscreens containing hazardous UV filters from 2020. Hawaii in the US has also announced a similar ban from 2021. In Hong Kong, there is no similar regulation yet. Are our waters and corals not being affected? Dr. James Lam, Associate Professor, Department of Science and Environmental Studies, the Education University of Hong Kong, and his research team specialize in studying contaminants in the ocean and their effects on the marine ecology, in particular contaminants of emerging concerns. Five years ago, they started a study on the effects of UV filters in personal care products on local corals. Dr. Lam explained that he is concerned of BP3 because of its high toxicity. With such high toxicity and concentration of UV filters in Hong Kong waters, are corals in Hong Kong being affected? To know the impact, Dr. Lam and his team collected specimens of corals, sediments and water in eastern Hong Kong waters for laboratory analysis. The study shows that five types of UV filters are present in the specimens. Among them, BP3 has the highest concentration and impact. With such fine weather and beautiful sea, everyone wants to enjoy sunshine and the beach. UV index in Hong Kong is usually high, not just in summer, but all year round. Everyone puts on sunscreen to avoid sunburn. How can we protect ourselves without actually contaminating the ocean? Let's look at sun protection from another perspective. According to the Environmental Protection Department, the overall compliance rate for water quality objectives of Hong Kong waters is 88%. Among the eastern, central, southern and western waters, water quality of deep bay in western waters ranks the lowest, while those of central and eastern waters rank the highest. In eastern waters, where most corals grow, Mers Bay and Port Shelter in Sai Kung compliance rate is 100%. In Tolo Harbour and Channel, compliance rate is only at 79%. Tolo Harbour waters includes Tolo Channel, which extends to Mers Bay on the east. It is the harbour's only gateway to the sea. Tolo Harbour is a shallow, semi-enclosed water body, which is essentially landlocked so water exchange is inferior to port shelter. Chinese University's Marine Science Laboratory by Tolo Harbour has been performing studies on local coral. 
Professor Angput Jr. grew up in Philippines. He had been studying corals in Southeast Asia prior to joining Chinese University in 1994 and carried on studies of corals in Hong Kong. He learned from documents that underwater world of Tolo Harbor has changed substantially after 1980. Professor Ang said, from 1980 to 1986, in just six years, coral coverage in Tolo Harbor dropped from 70% to less than 10%. The reason was serious marine pollution. In the mid-1980s, the government implemented the Tolo Harbor Action Plan which includes control of livestock waste, discharging export of treated sewage effluents into Victoria Harbour instead of Tolo Harbour, and extending village sewage in the water catchment area. Water quality of Tolo Harbour gradually improved. How to help? They launched a coral restoration project. Apple was a researcher in Professor Ung's team. Later, she succeeded the project. Restoration is a long process. It starts from breeding. They breed corals by both sexual and asexual reproduction. Asexual reproduction involves collecting coral fragments from the sea. Sexual reproduction is performed by collecting gametes and breeding them in the laboratory. With years' experience of putting corals back to the sea, or trial planting of corals, they launched a project to plant corals in Tolo Harbour. Most marine refuse comes from land. Don't think refuse only comes from the shore. Indeed, urban refuse goes into the sea through sewage drains. Even refuse left by hikers in the mountains goes into the sea through rivers and streams. Last year, the government collected almost 15,000 tons of marine refuse. Refuse of all kinds are commonly seen washed ashore or floating on the sea. Most of them are plastic wastes. An eco-education institute is organizing a snorkeling class today. This is not just for fun. They teach participants environmental protection knowledge and have expectations on them. Humanity accuses you of destroying marine ecology, releasing toxic gases while burning, overproduction and failure to fulfill social responsibility. How do you plead? Not guilty. Our ancestors were hailed as a great invention for the portability, durability and economy. We've served humanity for over half a century. There are widespread traces of us in every household. It's not my fault that I wasn't made into someone's beloved cup. Humans are the guilty ones for dumping us after they're done with us. I have footage from when I was alive as evidence. It's me again. The plastic bottle that's just been thrown away. I've become marine trash after being blown into the sea. But I'll be invisible soon because the sun's UV rays and the waves will shatter me into a million pieces, measuring just five millimeters. I'll become microplastic waste that drifts in ocean or gets eaten by marine organisms coming back into contact with humans via the food chain. Professor Chen King Ming began looking into the presence of microplastics in Hong Kong's waters as early as 2015. He collected plastic out at sea and also looked for the traces in seafood. In the end, he chose the oyster, a filter feeder, as the indicator for his experiments. He estimated the extent of contamination in the food chain by analyzing the amount of microplastics found in oysters. The research revealed that the oysters sold at local wet markets are generally contaminated by microplastics. Some samples even contained a whopping 100 pieces of microplastic. The professor said that various studies have shown that microplastics are present in mollusks, crustaceans and even fish. Even if they're rinsed before cooking, only the microplastic particles on the surface get washed off. Does that mean we shouldn't eat any seafood at all? 
The professor pointed out that even if we do consume microplastic particles, 90% of them will be passed out of the body through excretion. However, what he's most concerned about is that microplastics will introduce harmful substances found in seawater into the body and cause unknown illnesses. Researcher YY works in food inspection. He's currently testing the adsorption interaction between microplastics and marine pollutants. For now, the scientific community has yet to produce evidence that microplastics have negative effects on our health. However, clinical trials involving animals have shown that they do affect the organs and even cells. Professor Joseph Sung believes that, despite their minute size, microplastics pose an enormous threat to humanity. Microplastics lurk in every corner of the city. Some ride on the wind, while some flow into rivers via water pipes. They ultimately gather at sea. In 2015, Dr. Cheung Siu Gin began conducting research related to microplastics. He compared the amount of microplastics collected at 20 beaches in East and West Hong Kong and found no significant differences between them. He deduced that microplastic pollution doesn't only originate in the Pearl River estuary to the west, but very likely the city's rivers too. Today, his team has brought us to Xingmun River in Sha Tin to look for traces of microplastics. Carmen is the PhD student responsible for this study. She plans on collecting water samples from the Xingmun, Lamchun, Chunmun and Muwo rivers in different seasons over two years to analyze their microplastic content. This is her ninth time collecting samples from Xingmun. Walking along Xingmun River, we noticed there was rubbish everywhere. Plastic bags, water bottles and even mops. According to the Drainage Services Department, Hong Kong sewage treatment facilities can remove 80% of microplastics from the water they process after primary and secondary treatment. They're not entirely eliminated. Synthetic fibers are found in most clothes. This means that both you and I may be indirectly complicit in marine pollution. According to data from the International Union for Conservation of Nature, 35% of microplastic pollution is attributed to synthetic fibers. Edwin's team began exploring how to recycle synthetic fibers using high temperature and high pressure technologies in 2015 so that discarded clothing can be reused as yarn, thereby reducing the amount of pollution caused by wastefulness. Rise of food delivery platforms coupled with COVID-19 outbreak Takeaway has become popular. Plastic tableware is being disposed of at alarming rates. A green group conducted a survey in April 2020. During the pandemic, more than 100 million pieces of disposable plastic are consumed a week. In 2018, 4.17 tons of municipal solid waste was disposed of at landfills with a daily average of more than 11,000 tons. Plastic waste ranks third in municipal solid waste. Plastic disposal is up to 2,300 tons per day, of which plastic and polyfoam dining wares account for 210 tons, equivalent to the weight of 14 double-decker buses. Takeaway has become so popular. Is it 100% safe to use plastic dining ware? Food and Environment Hygiene Department and Consumer Council conducted a joint study on plastic food containers provided by food establishments and school meal suppliers. Results showed all samples were suitable for holding acidic, non-fatty foods at less than or equal to 100 degrees Celsius. With proper use, food safety is not a problem. Hong Kong is not short of mass events, such as food fairs and carnivals, etc. Events consume a lot of disposable dining ware. A group of eco-conscious young people couldn't stand the huge waste resulted from massive use of disposable dining ware. They started a dining ware rental service. Judith let us visit their warehouse today. With three years' effort, 
Judith's company started with 30 sets of ceramic dining ware, growing from serving small parties to marathons and even large-scale carnivals, estimated to save half a million pieces of disposable dining ware. Paul is a Taekwondo coach born in the 1990s. He teaches at schools and sports centers. Since a year ago, he has been living solo and doing all domestic chores by himself. Can he beat our zero disposable challenge? Even with a good course, under the pandemic, Wayne had to temporarily switch from reusable dining ware to disposable. This program has conducted a survey on the use of wet wipes. It reveals that around 20% of survey participants used 10 to 19 pieces of wet wipes in the past seven days. The amount is not small. In the UK, the wet wipes problem is even worse. Some British used to throw wet wipes into the toilet. Non-biodegradable wipes caught fat and grease in a sewer, formed fatty masses and caused blockages. A study in 2017 shows that, among all sewer blockages in the UK, more than 90% are wet wipes. A wet wipe comprises of water and various chemicals, including preservatives, moisturizers, disinfectants, artificial fragrance, fluorescent whitening agents to make it look white, and surfactants to clean. So many chemicals indeed. We use them often. Is it bad for our skin? In 2020, France banned the use of non-biodegradable. April 2020, UK banned. From end of 2020, China banned all. From July 2019, New York. From 2021, EU banned. 1994, South Korea. By 2030, Taiwan plans to ban all disposable plastic products. COVID-19 has become a global pandemic. As of late September 2020, there have been more than 33 million confirmed cases and over a million deaths worldwide. The WHO has been promoting the Healthy Cities concept in recent years, but rapid global environmental changes pose various challenges to the well-being of our cities. Swift urbanization, cramped living conditions, population aging, climate change, and infectious diseases, to name a few. Can urban space design and planning keep up with these changes? In 2003, Professor Joseph Sung fought against SARS on the front line. He believes that COVID-19 will have a more profound impact on society than SARS. During the SARS epidemic in 2003, a community outbreak occurred at Amoy Gardens. The expert committee later discovered that the housing estate's extra deep light wells caused a chimney effect, allowing the virus to ride on the rising air and spread to different floors. After SARS subsided, the government reviewed its citywide cleanup measures. Professor Edward Ng's team helped the planning department conduct research in hopes of improving site wind availability by amending urban planning guidelines. Unideal urban layouts and the abundance of wall effect buildings are suffocating our city. In light of this, Professor Ng introduced the use of the urban climatic map, which originates in Germany, with the aim of obtaining scientific data that can serve as guidance for urban planning. Apart from using scientific data to improve living conditions, architects can also create healthier living spaces through design. Ada is a seasoned architect. Before retiring, she was the deputy director of housing of the housing department responsible for public housing development. One of Ada's most memorable projects is the redevelopment of Soho Estate. 14 years passed between the initial surveying and the completion of the second phase. The redevelopment of the entire estate enabled Ada to make use of the latest technologies in determining the direction of the prevailing wind, resulting in a building arrangement which facilitates optimal ventilation. The greenhouse effect is causing global warming, in Hong Kong, extreme precipitation events are becoming more and more frequent.
In the past, hourly rainfall records were only broken once every several decades. However, over the past 20 years, this record has already been broken twice. The sudden increase in rainfall volumes may overwhelm our city's drainage systems. The risk of large-scale floods in urban areas also continues to rise. Amid global warming, how do we tackle the challenges of flooding through urban planning? The DSD has implemented different flood protection schemes in the new territories and urban districts to prepare for extreme weather events. This movable weir is controlled by a computer. It opens when there's heavy downpour, allowing water to flow into this underground storage pond with a capacity equivalent to 24 Olympic-sized swimming pools. When the rain eases, it reopens slowly to discharge the water into the sea. This design significantly reduces the use of water pumps, enabling it to save energy. Over the past 26 years, the DSD has eliminated a total of 126 flooding black spots through various drainage improvement projects. Works are also underway at the five remaining sites. Apart from flood protection, it's also hoped that next-generation stormwater management concepts will also enable water harvesting to maximize resource use. Consequently, researchers are looking into other potential uses of stormwater. At CIC Zero Carbon Park, architect Tony gets to try out various new green building technologies. Through testing them, he hopes to find viable solutions to tackle climate change. Hong Kong is a small place. Only a quarter of its land is developed. Most population and buildings are concentrated in urban areas, making it one of the most densely populated cities in the world. To architects and engineers who design and build buildings, what is a quality living environment? Can environment protection and well-being coexist? Tony is a green architect. He designed CIC Zero Carbon Park in Kowloon Bay, the first zero carbon building in Hong Kong. He created spaces there to pilot test new technologies in green architecture. Today, I'll show you the Hong Kong office of an international property group and share their insights in creating a healthy indoor environment. I know this is the first Hong Kong project accredited with both LEED, Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design, and World Platinum Certifications. It does not look high-tech at all. Are there any secrets behind this? Well covers 10 concepts. Air, light, water, thermal comfort, sound, materials, Movement, nourishment, mind or stress reduction, and community. Andrew is a building services engineer. His expertise is in enhancing indoor environment with technology. In addition to environment, food and water are also important factors to well-being. Well requires the design of an environment to enable users to have easy access to healthy, nutritious food and clean, potable water. For example, this huge pantry is for employees to bring their own meals and eat here. Beverages in the fridge are all low or zero sugar. Wide varieties of fruits are provided throughout the day. The landlord of the service department wants a comfortable and healthy environment for the occupants, he asked Andrew to design an environment that fits the well concepts. Indeed, a well living does not necessarily cost you a lot. In the next part, we will show you how to live healthy even if you're home. We call her Aling. She's 25. She grew up in a subdivided flat. 
the poor living environment was a dominant part of her growing up. At 22, Aling consulted a counsellor at university and was told she had depression. Corinne is engaged in mental wellness studies at the University of Hong Kong. In 2010, they launched a large-scale study on mental wellness. Over 5,700 persons were surveyed. Corinne randomly chose 1,000 cases for home visits to understand the relationship between living environment and mental wellness. Through the home visits, Corinne noted an important protection factor from people living in a poor environment. Yay. Aling rents a two-bedroom flat with a friend. To her, having a private room decorated by herself is already a dream come true. It is worthwhile despite spending most of her salary. Dr Chan thinks mental wellness is complex and affected by many different factors. To urban people, stress is an important factor to mental health. The effect of environment on people is largely subjective rather than objective. If you do not like a place, you cannot be happy in it, even if it is a palace. Corinne has lived in Taipo for many years and is happy with the neighborhood. We may not have an ideal choice of where we live or the size of our home, but beyond the four walls, many things can add colors to our lives. Dalulin is a district council member where Corinne lives. Since elected in 2019, he injected green elements to many community events. Dalulin thinks community network, ecological environment, and even egrets in the nearby woodlands are all relevant to people's health. Hong Kong is filled with cars and people. You may not know it, but we're inhaling poisonous gases on a daily basis. According to the Headley Environmental Index developed by the School of Public Health of the University of Hong Kong, we were only able to breathe in clean air for less than half the year in 2019. Air pollution has led to an additional 130,000 days of hospital beds being occupied and 2.3 million attendances at our hospitals. Experts predict that air pollution increases the risk of stroke, heart disease, lung cancer, and chronic respiratory disorders, resulting in mass deaths. Coming in after high blood pressure, poor diet, and smoking, air pollution has already become the fourth leading cause of death in the world. In Hong Kong, four people die from air pollution every day. That's the equivalent of at least 1,700 deaths a year. The WHO released its list of top 10 threats to global health in 2019. Air pollution is included and is considered one of the greatest environmental risks to health by the organization. Introduced by the Environmental Protection Department, EPD, in 2013, the Air Quality Health Index, AQHI, uses the concentration levels of pollutants such as nitrogen dioxide, sulfur dioxide, ozone, particulate matter PM10 and PM2.5, recorded at the monitoring stations to predict the short-term health risks to citizens. The AQHI is reported on a scale of 1 to 10 and 10 plus, and is grouped into five health risk categories. However, both roadside and general monitoring stations only measure the air quality near ground level. What affects us more often is the air at higher altitudes. To monitor the air quality at high altitudes, it's necessary to use a LiDAR to make vertical measurements. Among the various types of air pollutants, we're especially concerned about suspended particulates that are thinner than our hair. The suspended particulates that we speak of are the particles drifting in the air that are so tiny that they may even be invisible to the eye. Apart from suspended particulates, Another common pollutant is ozone. 
In addition to pollution by local contaminants, sometimes on the eve of a typhoon, the subsidence at a storm's outer circulation can affect convective activity in the atmosphere, making it easier for suspended particulates to accumulate at ground level, thereby causing a severe case of haze. On July 9, 2016, under the influence of Typhoon Nepetuk, the EPD recorded an AQHI of 10 plus, the highest reading, at all 16 monitoring stations simultaneously for the first time, resulting in a health risk in the serious category. Meanwhile, due to its geographical location, pollutants are also often blown to Hong Kong from the Pearl River Delta or even beyond. These air pollutants, especially suspended particulates, have severe consequences on our health. Air pollution is also the culprit behind ever-increasing social costs. According to a study by the CUHK Jockey Club School of Public Health and Primary Care, just an increase of one microgram of nitrogen dioxide, NO2, per cubic meter, results in the government paying an extra 330,000 Hong Kong dollars for the treatment of cardiovascular diseases and another 360,000 Hong Kong dollars for the treatment of respiratory diseases. When talking about social costs, in addition to money, we must also consider the value of a human life. Although the air quality in Hong Kong has improved significantly over the past 20 years, it's impossible to make the environment that we live in completely free of air pollution. Human habitation inevitably increases the extent of air pollution. The government has launched various measures to improve the air quality in Hong Kong. For example, encouraging citizens to use renewable energy, tightening the restrictions on pollutant emissions by power plants, requiring all vessels within Hong Kong waters to use compliant fuel, encouraging the application of green architecture such as putting more thought into ways of using natural light to conserve energy and improve the environment, as well as planting more trees on our streets. Yes, we can also change our lifestyle to reduce the emission of pollutants. Apart from using less air conditioning, can you also rely less on private vehicles and take public transport or even walk instead? We invited four groups of people to participate in this social experiment, including youngsters and the elderly. They either live or work in Sham Shui Po. We chose a location in Sham Shui Po and measured the air quality along their route to work. After gathering this data, we looked for other routes nearby which would enable them to reach the same destination and made measurements along them. Finally, based on the pollution levels, we designed healthier routes which we suggested them to take. When it comes to transportation, we all know that the bus is the source of one of the main pollutants, nitrogen dioxide. Although the government of the HKSAR once subsidized various bus companies to test the use of electric buses, due to issues such as the humid local climate, the large number of steep roads and battery efficiency, the results were unideal. Some people think that it's unsuitable to cycle in Hong Kong due to the severe air pollution along its roads. Nonetheless, a group of people have chosen to ride to work. Despite the air on our roads being so dirty, why do they still insist on promoting the use of the bicycle? To solve the problem of air pollution, there are still many things that we need to do. However, our values and inclinations always determine our attitude towards life. Health often takes a back seat when it comes to our priorities. Isn't this something worth contemplating? Household appliances make our lives easier, but how should we choose between convenience and environment protection?
Mrs. Wu will move to a bigger flat shortly to allow more space for her child. Most appliances in this flat are working well, but Mrs. Wu will not take them to the new flat. Old appliances are to be disposed of. What about those newer ones? To understand eco-awareness of the public when replacing household appliances, a program commissioned Hong Kong Public Opinion Research Institute to conduct a survey by phone and online. Results show that in the past 12 months, air conditioners, television sets and fans ranked the top among replaced appliances. 73% of respondents replaced appliances out of order, yet 23% of respondents replaced appliances in good conditions because they were old models. The survey also revealed that 60% of respondents would choose replacement over repair when a less than $500 appliance is broken. Respondents generally will consider repair only when an appliance costs more than $3,000. Community green stations collect small appliances and pass them to qualified recyclers. What about those big appliances? 70,000 tons of waste electrical and electronic equipment, WEEE, are produced in Hong Kong annually. In 2018, the government implemented the producer responsibility schemes on WEEE. Consumers are required to pay a recycling levy upon buying regulated electrical equipment, REE, that is air conditioners, refrigerators, washing machines, televisions and computers. They can have free removal service to dispose of the old equipment later on, so it won't end up in landfill, killing two birds with one stone. Government data shows that in the first six months of 2020, Eco Park in Tun Moon has handled 11,000 tons of disposed REE. 6,000 tons of metals have been recycled. Even without right to repair in Hong Kong yet, we can use our force as consumers to prompt changes and push manufacturers or retailers to provide greater maintenance and repair support. Gary's company is a dealer as well as a maintenance service provider. Mrs. Wu finally moved into her new home. How does she handle the unwanted appliances? There are many new appliances with increasingly new functions. Our survey reveals that 10% respondents replace their appliances out of the tempting functions of new products. Buying, however, does not mean utilizing. 45% respondents indicated that they use only a small number of the functions or even down to one for some. Looks like they're buying out of novelty rather than actual needs. Molds can be found anywhere your home or mine. Never ignore them because they grow fast and will spread. Circle has been living here for three years. Molds invaded the bathroom only a few months after she moved in. In 2019, Mold was listed a parameter of indoor air quality certification scheme for offices and public places. According to a guide on prevention and control of indoor mold published by the Environmental Protection Department, a molding environment may increase the risk of allergic reactions to people prone to allergy. Molds normally grow in humid environments. Circles Flat is fairly open and airy, with sunlight from the west in the afternoon. Why is molding so serious in the bathroom? Is Circle's bathroom filled with spores? Professor Mui is collecting mildew specimens from the ceiling and air specimens for laboratory testing. Results are expected in a week. We are testing the effectiveness of a negative iron air purifier in three different environments. First, an enclosed glass chest. Secondly, an indoor domestic environment. Lastly, an outdoor environment. In the first two environments, we increase the dust amount by burning incense sticks. Air purifying effect is obvious in an enclosed environment. In reality, we do not live in an enclosed environment. Comparing with the enclosed environment, no obvious effect of the air purifier was noted in both the indoor and outdoor environments. In the outdoor test, I was wearing an air purifier while the professor was not. We use devices to measure the dust amount in our respective breathing spaces. Please check if you have any idle electrical and electronic devices. 
you can give it to someone who needs it. Think twice before you buy. If we keep buying only to fulfill our desires, the earth will end up paying the bills. The price is way too high. As the Chinese saying goes, having a good appetite is a blessing. Hong Kongers have always been foodies. But have you ever thought about how much food goes to waste each day as we enjoy all sorts of culinary delights? Is excessive eating and drinking good for our climate, environment or health? Like many Hong Kongers, Ling loves to eat. But her overeating led to a big problem, weight gain. She weighed almost 240 pounds at her heaviest. As her weight remained consistently high, Ling underwent gastric bypass surgery in 2017. Although her health has improved, her doctor believes that it's more important for her to regulate her food intake. This is the only way that she can control her weight and keep it from... To find out whether we need to lose weight, many of us turn to the Body Mass Index, BMI. According to the WHO's guidelines, for Asians, a BMI between 18.5 and 22.9 is considered normal. A person with a reading over 23 is classified as overweight, while a person with a BMI over 25 is considered obese. However, a reading within the normal range doesn't mean you are healthy. Men with a waist measuring 90 centimeters or above and women 80 centimeters or above are categorized as having central obesity. According to a study, people with obesity and central obesity are more likely to develop colorectal cancer. The risk of prostate cancer for men and breast cancer for women is also significantly increased. The weight of Hong Kongers is constantly on the rise, resulting in more and more health problems. Apart from affecting our health, our eating habits also have an impact on the ecological environment because the more we eat, the more food waste we create. According to the Environmental Protection Department, in 2018, an average of 3,565 tons of food waste was generated daily, accounting for one-third of the municipal solid waste disposed at our landfill. Hong Kongers love to dine out. Delicious food can be found everywhere. Our city offers every single cuisine you can think of. All leftovers become food waste. This issue is of particular concern when it comes to all-you-can-eat restaurants. Although this restaurant already has measures in place to reduce food waste, only a small amount gets used. The majority of the food waste is treated as normal rubbish destined for the landfill. To reduce the burden of food waste, the government established an organic resources recovery center in Siu Ho Wan in 2019 to recycle some of the city's industrial and commercial food waste. Using anaerobic digestion technology, the facility turns food waste into biogas for electricity generation. It can export a maximum of 14 million kilowatt hours of electricity. However, it can only handle 200 tons of food waste per day. Compared to the 3,600 tons of food waste generated daily in Hong Kong, it's a mere drop in the ocean. According to a UN study, roughly one-third of all food produced every year, which is about 1.3 billion tons, is wasted. For example, large quantities of food are disposed of daily at our supermarkets and wet markets for going past their expiry dates, being unsold and various other... In addition to the waste problem, Food itself has a certain impact on the environment. This is especially true of meat. It turns out that for every one kilogram of beef produced, close to 36 kilograms of carbon dioxide is generated. Moreover, the production of food requires immense resources, including enormous amounts of water and land. In addition, the processing, freezing, and transportation of food also increase carbon emissions, exacerbating climate change. 
To encourage people to reduce the impact that their diet is having on climate change, this restaurant has adopted a low-carbon management model. Be it in terms of purchasing, cooking or managing, it aims to emit as little carbon as possible. It hopes to promote this model within the industry. Chen Yafan thinks that organic farming is tougher than conventional farming and requires more human resources. Furthermore, supply stability is easily affected by factors such as the seasons and the weather. People's eating habits can't be changed overnight. Compared to its neighbours, Hong Kong is still relatively behind in terms of food handling and food waste reduction. Therefore, be it the government, food industry or citizens, we must be more active in improving the situation. According to the Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO, 156 million tons of seafood are consumed globally every year. In Hong Kong, the annual consumption is 500,000 tons. Its per capita consumption is 71.8 kilograms, which is the second highest in Asia. It exceeds the global per capita rate by 300%. Dr. Ng Ziyan of Marine Biology has been engaged in projects or activities of environmental or ecological conservation. She said to understand local coral ecology, one could start from surveying coral coverage and reading various fish indicators. Hong Kong is a major coral reef fish trading center with an annual turnover of 7.8 billion Hong Kong dollars. Coral reef fish generally refers to fish living in areas between corals and rocks. They are large and eat smaller fish. They are at a higher level of the food chain. Groupers and humphead wrasses are fish in this category. Studies show that common edible coral reef fish, such as comet groupers and high-finned groupers, are overexploited and at risk of extinction. If we continue to consume large coral reef fish without constraints, we are causing irreversible damage to the marine ecology. Actually, eating those valuable coral reef fish in large volume is not good to the environment and may risk... Dr. Leung Ho Man, who studies environmental science and toxicology, shared some fish-eating tips with us. Although local consumption of fish is high, it is not easy to run a fish farm in Hong Kong. Today, Dr. Leung takes us to an accredited fish farm to understand their operation. Substitute cultured fish for wild-caught fish, to some extent, can slow down depletion of ocean resources. However, massive aquaculture may also generate other issues. Both wild capture and aquaculture are not always environmentally friendly it is important to have effective regulation. Know the species, production method, and origin. To implement such a labeling system, Dr. Sadovi suggests starting with expensive coral reef fish. Recently, Dr. Sadovi's team has developed a mobile app for facial recognition to verify whether a humphead wrasse on sale is legally imported or not. They begin with humphead wrasse because it's an endangered species under regulation. The pattern on the head of each humphead wrasse is unique. So are the lines around their eyes. Facial recognition technology therefore can apply. Anyway, we should know more about the fish that we eat every day. WWF Hong Kong has published a seafood guide, so we can use the consumer's power to influence the fish market. In the seafood guide, surprisingly, Eel and shrimp are listed as red. They are popular and widely available in supermarkets. Why are they red? To enjoy environmentally friendly and sustainable seafood, consumers inevitably need to pay more. There are restaurants willing to use sustainable seafood at higher costs. In this episode, we have looked at wild captured and cultured marine fish. Both of them have certain impact on the environment and marine ecology. 
nature provides us with many resources. However, if we keep consuming them without control, we will end up losing the precious marine resources. Being a consumer, are we willing to pay more for better management? Can we use the power of the consumers to maintain an environmental friendly, healthy and sustainable production model? Only by doing so, we can continue to enjoy the comfortable environment and delicious food that nature gives us.